comes from the Gospel according to Luke. We'll be reading from the sixth chapter, reading verses 17 through 26. Hear <coughs> God's word for us this morning. Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. <clears throat> but woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. This is the word of the Lord. May the words of, our, of my mouth and, and the meditations of our hearts and our minds, may they be acceptable in your sight. For you are God, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. So today we are starting a new sermon series. A series based on this uh, section from Luke's Gospel. A section that is a sermon that Jesus delivered. And we're told he delivered it on a, a level place. And so it's usually known as the Sermon on the Plain. The Sermon on the Plain is uh, a sermon that cont contains much of the same material that it is in Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount, but Luke always treats things a little differently, with different emphases. And so we're going to be looking at this, uh, this Sermon on the Plain for the next four weeks. And this sermon that Jesus delivers begins with, with blessings. Just as Matthew's begins with, uh, with the Beatitudes. But Jesus goes further than that in Luke's account. And this these, uh, these blessings and these woes that we'll be looking at today, they're, they're delivered to the, the people that have gathered right after Jesus is called the Twelve Apostles. And Jesus is being very intentional in what he is doing here. Jesus calls Twelve Apostles because God had chosen Twelve Tribes of Israel. And Jesus is Reenacting, he is, he is recapitulating what God has done through Israel. But Jesus is doing it the way God intended it to be done. And so after he has called the twelve apostles, whose job it is going to be to, to bring the good news to all the people of the world, after he has done that, he is inaugurating <coughs> This kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, that is what he has come to announce. And in this Sermon on the Plain, Jesus is saying, here are, are 
the guidelines, the rules for being part of this kingdom. Here's how people who are citizens of the kingdom of God behave and the things they ought to know. <coughs> and what Jesus says is not what we might expect. Because everything in the kingdom of God is kind of topsy-turvy. The kingdom of God is a place where the last will be first, and the first will be last. It's the kingdom that Paul is talking about, where, where what seems wise to men is foolish to God, and the other way around. And so when Jesus talks about what it means to be part of this kingdom, it's opposite from what we might expect. Everyone knows that you don't want to be poor. You don't want to be hungry. You don't, you don't want to be weeping. You don't want people to look down at you and despise you. But Jesus says, blessed are you when you're poor. Blessed are you when you're hungry. Blessed are you when you weep. Blessed are you when people hate you because you follow Christ. It's the opposite of what we expect. It doesn't, doesn't fit with the wisdom of human beings. But Jesus is saying that, that when we experience those things that seem like woes, seem like, like curses in life, it's a blessing in God's kingdom because it's when we are poor, when we're hungry, when we're weeping, when we're despised. <coughs> It's when those things happen that we know we can't rely on our own resources. It's when those things happen that we don't put our trust in our own abilities. It's when those things happen that we learn to put our trust in God. To follow Him and to seek His wisdom and His strength and not our own. And so we're blessed. When those things that seem bad in the world, when those things come to us. <coughs> but Jesus goes on from there. And he says, not only are you blessed when things that seem negative happen, but you're cursed with the opposite. He says, woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are well fed. Woe to you who laugh now. Woe to you when, when everyone speaks well of you, when you've got a great reputation. And he says it for the same reason. Because when we're, when we're rich, when we're well fed, when we laugh, when we're respected, we can come to believe that, that we've got it all together. That we know what we're doing that we are in control. And when we do that, we walk away from God. And that is a curse. The kingdom of God is a, a topsy-turvy place where things aren't what we expect them to be. And in this Sermon on the Plain, Jesus is teaching the people this. But the disciples and the people from the surrounding region who heard Jesus speak would have noticed something else in here that you and I are unlikely to see. You see, when Jesus stands before them and he pronounces these, these blessings and woes, these, these blessings and curses, his disciples and the other people would say, oh, I know where I've heard this before. Because back in the book of Joshua, when the people entered into the promised land, when the kingdom of Israel was inaugurated, once they had established for themselves there, they had half the people on one mountain and half on another, proclaiming the blessings and the woes, or the blessings and the curses of the covenant that God had given to the people through Moses. Jesus is not just saying, this is how the world is in the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, I am making covenant with you. You 
are to be a covenant people. And covenant is one of those things that, that we struggle with. It's, it's one of those churchy words that we're not always sure what it means. Covenant is the same word that is translated testament when we talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. <coughs> a covenant is an agreement between two parties, but it's different than the kinds of agreements we're typically used to. In our culture, we're much more likely to make deals, to make contracts, than we are to make covenants. And they're different things. A contract or, or a deal is an agreement that is based primarily on distrust. A contract says, I don't have to fulfill my end of the bargain if you don't fulfill your end. I will do the right thing if and only if you do the right thing. It's protection in case the other party doesn't come through. It's based on mistrust. But a covenant, a covenant is a, a pledge based on trust and mutual concern. A covenant says, I will do the right thing regardless of what you do. I will stick by you for better or worse. I will stick by you even when you mess up. Not without consequence, but I will not break my covenant with you. And covenant is an important thing because our God is a covenant God. God makes covenant with his people all the way through. We see it here with Jesus making covenant with the new people, his followers. But we see it back with Adam and Eve, we see it with Noah. We see it with Moses, and we see it with Abraham. And when God forms the covenant with Abraham, we learn something very significant about it. You see, covenants always have blessings and curses. If you, if you fulfill the covenant, you'll be blessed in these ways. If you fail in the covenant, you will be cursed in these ways. As part of the covenant, that's part of what keeping covenant meant. And covenants were made between a stronger and a weaker party, usually. And in, in Genesis 15, we read about the covenant that God made with Abraham. Abraham has been promised by God that he is going to be the, the father of many, many people. <coughs> more than the stars in the heaven, more than the sands on the, on the beach. And Abraham says to God, you know, you, you say this, but I don't even have a single child. I don't have an heir. Everything I have is going to go to my servant. And God says, no. Trust me. I am making covenant with you. And then he tells Abraham to do something that seems odd to us. He says, take a cow and a sheep and a goat and cut them in half and lay the house and the carcasses down in a row. And we look at that as just, it seems kind of odd to us. But at the time, this was the way a covenant was, was made. It was affirmed. Okay. It's like the closing deal. And what happened was that the weaker party would walk between these carcasses, proclaiming that they are going to follow this covenant. And what they're saying symbolically is if I fail to keep the covenant. May what has been done to these animals be done to me. May I be torn in two. May I be rent asunder. And the curious thing that happens with Abraham here is he, he lays them out, but God never asks him to walk through between them. Instead, God passes between these animals as smoke and fire, just like he would appear to the people of Israel in the desert as a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. God walks through these animals. 
God, the stronger party, is saying, if you do what you are asked to do, if you fulfill the covenant, I will bless you. And if you fail in the covenant, there will be curses. But I will take the curse on myself. I will be the one who will be torn in two, who will bleed, who will suffer. And Jesus is the God who makes that covenant with us. The one who, when we have failed to keep covenant with God, takes the curse upon himself on the cross. A different covenant than the world would ever know. God is a, a covenant God. He's made covenant with his people all along, and, and Jesus is re renewing that covenant, making a new covenant here with his people. And we are called to be a covenant people who keep covenant not only with our God, but with one another. We are called to be a people who, who love one another, a people who forgive one another, a people who walk with each other, even when one of us falls down. And that's something we have seen this week. And what I'm sharing with you, I'm sharing with, with permission and blessing from Kim. Thank you. Many of you, I'm sure, have read about, about what Kim has done. Kim Tanky, who is a member of our congregation, who is our sister in Christ, who is an elder in this congregation, and has been a member of session. A number of years back, Kim stole a significant amount of money from the county. <coughs> she failed. She sinned. And yet in coming back to church and getting involved with this body of Christ, God has been speaking to her and working in her. And she has been struggling with this secret that she has kept for quite a few years now. And when an audit was done and she realized that somebody else was going to be going through a lot of uh, problems dealing with that, the current treasurer was going to be very stressed with dealing with this situation, Kim said, no, I need to come forward. I need to confess what I have done. I need to repent and deal with the consequences. And Kim is doing that. She has gone forward and confessed to what she's done. And she is making restitution. And we don't know what the legal system is going to do yet. She may receive a deferred sentence. She may do jail time. I don't know what the legal system is going to do, but I'm more concerned about what we do as covenant people who are in covenant with this sister of ours. Are we the kind of people who know that we too are forgiven sinners, who can reach out in love and support and encouragement to someone who has sinned and repented? Are we the kind of people who, through the way we treat one another, make witness to our community and to the world what it is to be the people of God? Are we the ones who know that Christ has paid our penalty on the cross? And he's paid her penalty on the cross as well. In proclaiming these, these blessings and woes, Jesus is calling us to be covenant people. In covenant with him, in covenant with one another. <clears throat> May we show that to our community and to the world as we love one another in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.